Hello everyone. Thank you for joining this event from wherever you may be viewing. I'll begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are located and pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. My name is Luan Ismahil and I'm the founder and director of the Convergence Science Network. This webinar is being recorded and will be available online at a future date. I invite you to invite you to make a comment or ask a question of the presenter via the chat option at the right of the screen. Artificial intelligence, or AI as it is most commonly referred to, is not a recent development, but one that is now shaping up to be a major transformative force in society. Consciously or unconsciously, we interact with AI each and every day. In medical research, AI is already being used in the development of pharmaceuticals, the analysis of X-ray imaging, and the development of products and services. But many people remain confused about the meaning of AI, so today we are going to share the basics of AI with you. Over the next 12 months, the Convergence Science Network will be holding a series of events exploring the role of AI in biomedicine. To prepare us for these discussions, today we are going to examine the history of AI. What exactly is AI? And is patent law keeping up or not with its advance? I'm delighted to welcome Helen McFazian, who will tackle these questions. Helen is a senior associate at Phillips Ormond Fitzpatrick, a leading Australian intellectual property and patent attorney firm headquartered in Melbourne. Helen is a registered patent and trademarks attorney in Australia and New Zealand. She has successfully obtained patents, trademarks and designs for many businesses in Australia and overseas in a large number of technology areas, including machine learning, and image classification, embedded software, and control systems. Helen, welcome. Thank you for joining us to share your knowledge and expertise in AI. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks, Luan, and uh, many thanks to the Convergence Science Network for the opportunity to uh, present this evening. Um, so I will get started. Um, Colin, can everyone see my slides? Yep. Fantastic. All right. So let's get started. Uh, so what is AI? AI is a subfield of computer science and uh, it involves the simulation of human intelligence processes by machines. Some of today's applications include things like natural language processing, speech recognition and machine vision. On one side of the spectrum, uh, we have artificial general intelligence, which is considered to be the holy grail of the AI community. There's lots of different definitions. Uh, one example definition is the ability for machines to carry out a number of different cognitive tasks. Another definition uh, example is um, human level intelligence and uh, potentially even beyond human level intelligence, also known as uh, super intelligence in machines. And experts disagree as to whether or not this is actually achievable. Regardless, there are four notable AI companies um, out there today trying to achieve some form of artificial general intelligence. And many of you may have heard of these companies. Uh, they are OpenAI, Google DeepMind, Google Brain, and Facebook AI Research. Most of the AI systems today are considered narrow AI systems, uh, which means that they focus on performing a single task and they can perform this um, really well. Uh, and most of today's AI systems are, um, um, are narrow AI systems. And, and these and the examples that I will be talking about today are, are mostly considered narrow AI systems. And these are typically implemented using machine learning. And this involves the use of mathematical models to make predictions or decisions based on the training data. There's lots of different machine learning models out there. One example is an artificial neural network. Um, and this diagram is a very simple artificial neural network. Um, and the way that uh, you use this is um, you could potentially use uh, input data, which is labeled or unlabeled, 
uh, depending on if you're setting up a supervised or unsupervised learning system, you train the model using the data and a weighting associated with each of these nodes is iteratively adjusted until the training process is complete. And there's lots of different types of artificial neural networks. Um, each of them are typically adapted for solving a particular type of problem. Now let's have a look at um, the, a brief history of AI development, um, starting from the very beginning in the year 1950. So in the year 1950, Alan Turing published an article uh, called Computing Machinery and Intelligence, which proposes this idea of the imitation game, um, which involves a question that uh, considers whether or not machines can think. And this was the first time that this concept of intelligence in machines uh, came about. This later became the Turing test, um, which can be used to measure intelligence in machines. The standard interpretation of the Turing test um, can be illustrated in this diagram. Um, you have an interrogator, player C here, uh, which uh, uh, and this interrogator asks um, questions and based on answers received uh, from a, a either a computer um, uh, sorry a computer and um, a, a person um, uh, behind a wall uh, the um, the aim is for um, the interrogator to determine which player is a computer and which player is a human. Now, this is not the standard test which is being applied today, and there's also some controversy as to whether or not this is actually the appropriate test. Um, but nevertheless, it uh, forms an important component in the philosophy of AI and also uh, the basis for some discussions of intelligence and consciousness in machines. Some of you may have seen the movie Ex Machina. If you've seen it, you might remember that uh, in the movie, uh, there's this software programmer called Caleb, and he wins a contest to spend a week at the CEO's house. Um, and the CEO tells him to administer the Turing test to a very attractive robot called Ava. And Caleb has to judge whether Ava is genuinely capable of thought and consciousness. And the test will be passed if Caleb forgets that Ava is not human during their daily sessions. Um, this is a great, um, it's one of my favorite um, sci-fi movies. So if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Um, and when you watch it, you will um, know where the Turing test um, in the movie comes from. Now, uh, going back to uh, 1950, um, <clears throat> the concept of machines and intelligence around this time was um, very new and ahead of its time. Um, as you can imagine, um, around this time, computers didn't have a lot of memory, so they couldn't store commands and they could only execute them. And they were also uh, extremely expensive. To give you an idea, um, in the early 1950s, the cost of leasing a computer ran up to something like $200,000 in today's money per month. So only really prestigious universities and big technology companies could really afford to use them. And it was also difficult to get funding and convince people that AI was something that was worth pursuing. In 1956, the first artificial intelligence program was presented at the Dartmouth Summer Research Project on Artificial Intelligence. And this was hosted by someone called John McCarthy. He was a mathematic, uh, mathematics professor at Dartmouth at the time, uh, along with his colleague, Marvin Minsky. Uh, Top researchers from various fields were brought together for open-ended discussion on artificial intelligence. And this, at this conference, uh, the term artificial intelligence was coined uh, for the first time. Major figures from universities and top scientists from industry were introduced to each other at this conference. And for the next 20 years, the field was dominated by these people, their students and colleagues at places like MIT, CMU, Stanford, and IBM. Following the conference, there are some advances in the development of machine learning, machine learning algorithms. In the, 19, uh, in the year 1960, uh, someone called Joseph Weizenbaum developed an early natural language processing computer program called ELISA. And this was one of the first ever um, chatterbots the world had ever seen. ELISA simulated conversation by matching patterns and substituting words. 
and it was originally designed to emulate a psychotherapist. Uh, and it would simply take keywords from a user's message and then offer a question um, about whatever the user is talking about. Um, and this gave the user an illusion of understanding, but the program itself didn't have any built-in framework for contextualizing the events. So in this example um, shown on the slide here, you can see that the user is complaining about men and Eliza is asking questions based on the user's answers um, in order to simulate, stimulate ongoing conversation. In uh, around 1970, uh, the first human-like robot was built in Japan uh, at Washita University, and uh, its features included movable limbs, the ability to see, and also the ability to um, hold simple conversation. These early day successes, as well as the advocacy of leading researchers, convinced government agencies such as DARPA to fund AI research at several institutions. Around this time, optimism was high and expectations were even higher. In the year 1970, Marvin Minsky, um, you might remember he, he was one of the guys that hosted the Dartmouth conference that, um, that coined the, the, word, uh, the term AI. He told Life magazine that from three to eight years, we will have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. So they thought that um, by the 80s, we will be able to achieve human level AI. So whilst the basic proof of principle was there, there was still um, a long way to go. And they ran into a mountain of obstacles. One of the biggest problems was that there was a lack of computational power. Computers couldn't store enough information or process it fast enough. And eventually funding dwindled and research came to a slow roll for about 10 years. And this um, led to the first AI winter. In the early 1980s, computer became stronger and there was again an injection, injection of funding and investment um, and lots of companies built various expert systems, vision systems and robots. But many companies fell, to the, fell by the wayside as um, they failed to deliver on their extravagant promises. And this led to the second AI winter between the late 80s and the early 90s. By the late 90s, IBM had a few breakthroughs. In 1997, a chess playing computer called Deep Blue, developed by IBM, became the first system to win a chess game and match um, against uh, a world chess champion at the time. His name is Gary Kasparov. And in the year 2011, IBM's question answering system called Watson won the quiz show Jeopardy by beating champions Brad Rutter and Ken Jennings. In more recent years, with more powerful computers and the availability of larger data sets, um, this led to exponential growth in AI development. Around the year 2014, Google DeepMind started developing a computer program called AlphaGo. The computer program uses machine learning techniques to play this ancient game of Go. And if you don't know how to play this game, it's relatively simple. You essentially have two players, a white player and a black player, and each player takes it in turns to place a stone on one of the intersections on the board. Once you place a stone, you don't move it. Uh, and the objective of the game is to surround your opponent in order to capture territory. And once you surround um, the stones, you can take the, uh, the, the, the stones that you um, that, uh, that's in the middle. And at the, at the end of the game, uh, the player with the most territory wins. So why was this such a challenge for, um, for computers? Well, because it's a very abstract game. The rules are simple, but the game itself is of profound complexity. For each position of the white stone, there's hundreds of possible positions for the black stone in response, and then hundreds of possible positions for the white stone in response to that. So the search space in Go is more than 
10 to the power of 100 times larger than chess. Um, and to put this into context, um, it's a number that is greater than the total number of atoms in the observable universe. In March 2016, AlphaGo competed against the, uh, a legendary Go player, uh, Lee Sado in Korea, and around 200 million people watched this game worldwide, and AlphaGo beat Lee Sado, um, in the end 4-1. to one. Uh, This uh, was even made into an award-winning documentary uh, called AlphaGo, and the full version is available on YouTube and Netflix, and um, it's a great documentary, and if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it if you're interested. In 2014, a special class of machine learning systems called Generative Adversarial Networks, or um, also known as GANs, was invented by a guy called Ian Goodfellow. GANs can generate new data that resembles the training data. Um, some of the applications uh, that are being used today include, for example, if your classifier um, doesn't have enough, you don't have enough training data for your classifier, you could potentially use GANs to create additional training data, or you could potentially use it to increase the resolution of images. In some of the original applications in the early days, GANs was tested using facial images as training data in order to create new facial images. So you import pictures of people's faces and the model would output new faces that would look like, resemble the input faces. Um, and these are just some of the example outputs. You can see that back in 2015, the output, the quality of output wasn't great. Um, quite scary looking actually, but as um, the years went on, the quality improved. This um, here is output from a progressive GAN model um, using pictures of celebrities from the internet. Generative models such as GANs are um, also being used today as the underlying, underlying technology for deep fakes, um, which I'm sure that many of you are familiar with today. Generative models can also be used to generate sound. Uh, to demonstrate, uh, I'd like to play an AI generated clone of my voice. I am. I am welcome to this talk on AI. My name is Helen McFadzian, and I am so pleased to be speaking in front of you all. I hope you've enjoyed the seminar so far. So that was the output of a machine learning model that I trained to generate speech in my voice. And to train the model, um, you can simply read something out loud for um, typically, for example, 20 to 30 minutes, or you can upload a voice file. And once the model is trained, you can type in some text and the model will read it out uh, in your cloned voice. Machine learning models can also be used for natural language processing. Um, in this example, um, the, um, this is an example for uh, GPT-3, which is the latest language model from OpenAI. And you re might remember OpenAI is one of the research companies that's currently trying to get to AGI. Uh, and GPT-3 uses deep learning to produce human-like text. The full version has a capacity of something like 175 billion machine learning parameters. And this is um, an extract uh, from an article that is published in The Guardian, uh, which is entirely written by this model GPT-3. The instructions uh, given to this model uh, to generate this article um, was as follows. Please write a short op-ed around 500 words. Keep the language simple and concise. Focus on why humans have nothing to fear from AI. Earlier this year, OpenAI also rela released a, a new program called DALI 2, and this is a program that can generate images and art from text description in natural language. This uh, image here was generated by the model based on the text description, an astronaut lounging in a tropical resort in space in a vapor wave, in a vapor wave style. This image was generated based on the text teddy bears mixing sparkling chemicals as mad scientist in a steampunk style. And the text for this picture 
was Shibu Inu dog wearing a beret and black turtleneck. In November 2020, Google DeepMind designed an AI model called AlphaFold to solve a 50-year-old grand challenge called the protein folding problem. AlphaFold um, is capable of predicting a, a, a protein's 3D structure from its amino acid sequence three times more accurately than the next best system and is comparable to experimental methods. This is an incredibly important breakthrough because it helps us better understand proteins and their functions, which is useful in a huge range of research areas, including cures for disease, antibiotic resistance, and also potentially providing solutions to our microplastic problem. Earlier this month, uh, Google DeepMind released a new multimodal AI system called Gatto, which is capable of performing more than 600 different tasks. Unlike the previous AI systems that can only perform a single task, this one can perform many different tasks. It's arguably the most impressive all-in-one machine learning system um, we have seen so far. So this means that the same network with the same weights can engage in an interactive dialogue. For example, as shown here, um, caption images for example, as shown here, you input the image of the cat and the, the model is able to, to tell you that it's a cat that is sitting next to a brick wall. It can also play games and stack blocks with a robot arm. Gato uses 1.18 billion network parameters, which is vastly smaller than some of the very big language models, um, such as GPT-3, previously mentioned, that has 175 billion parameters. So what can we look forward to um, in the near future? Well, Huawei has released their vision for 6G, hopefully arriving in the year 2030. This is the next generation of advanced mobile communications, um, which will go far beyond just communications. In their media release, they said that this will serve as a distributed neural network that provides communication links to fuse the physical, cyber and biological worlds to create an era where everything will be sensed, connected and intelligent. It will lay solid foundation for intelligence of everything in the future. There's also the metaverse, or as Zuckerberg likes to refer to it, the embodied internet. Zuckerberg believes that um, AI is one of the most important foundation technologies of our time, and he sees AI as the key to unlocking the metaverse. Quantum AI is also an interesting um, and exciting area. It's basically the use of quantum computing for the computation of machine learning algorithms. Um, because of the additional computational capacity, this could enable rapid training of machine learning models to create optimized algorithms. And some people even believe that this could potentially remove some obstacles to artificial general intelligence. The image here is IBM's Q-System 1, which is the first circuit-based commercial quantum computer released in January 2019. So governments around the world have realized the importance of AI technology and are heavily investing in AI research and development. On 11th of February 2019, US President Trump signed the executive order on maintaining American leadership in AI and the Trump administration established the American AI initiative for growing and developing the AI industry in the US. In June 2021, the Australian government released an artificial intelligence action plan to position Australia as a global leader in AI technology. And as part of that plan, the National AI Centre within, within Cyrus Data 61 was launched in December 2021 to coordinate Australia's AI expertise and capabilities. In September 2021, the UK government released its national AI strategy, setting out a 10-year plan to make Britain a global AI superpower. In 2017, the Chinese government um, also released their strategic plan to lead the world of AI, called New Generation AI Development Plan for the year 2030. And it's evident from the massive increase in recent patent filings as well as the publication of AI scientific papers that there's clearly a heavy focus on uh, advancing this field coming from China. So clearly, as you can see, there um, is a bit of a race for AI dominance. 
Now let's have a look at um, a brief history of the patent system. The origins of the Australian patent system can be traced back to the medieval times. And in medieval England, monarchs used to uh, use letters patents, uh, also known as uh, open letters, to inform the public of various grants of land, pardons and privileges. Uh, the word patent actually comes from the Latin verb patio, which means to lay open, uh, hence um, open letters. Gradually, monarchs started to um, grant monopolies to se selected manufacturers. And we think that this practice started with King Henry VI. Here's a picture of him here, as early as around the year 1440. Elsewhere in Europe, similar practices started appearing and the world's first patent statue was enacted in Venice in the year 1474. In England, um, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, the Crown started to grant limited monopolies to traders that brought new things into the country. So all we had to do was bring something new that hadn't been used in the country before uh, and you could um, get a limited monopoly. Um, at this time, requirements of absolute novelty and inventiveness um, was not required. However, over time, the system was abused and the Crown started to grant monopolies um, to all their friends, their favourite people. Uh, and, and it was at one time, it was even used for common commodities such as starch and salt. And this was really bad for the trade um, and people became very angry and there was eventually a lot of unrest, a lot of uh, political pressure on the Crown. And on the, in the 16th century, there was a bit of a showdown between the Crown and the Parliament, which led to the establishment of the Statute of Monopolies in the year 1623. Um, I've just put the relevant part of the statute here. Basically, the statute said uh, um, that they are going to abolish all of these monopolies, previously granted monopolies, and stop granting similar monopolies in the future. And the only type of monopolies that they will be granting from now on will be to the sole working or making of this manner of new manufacture to the true and first inventor for a limited uh, period of 14 years. The statute was the first statutory expression of English patent law. And under the statute, monopolies could only be granted to inventions referred to as, um, as a manner of manufacture. There was also this requirement for newness, and it, it could only be granted for a limited duration of 14 years or less. On this uh, right side of the table, I've um, just included some highlights from um, today's patent legislation in Australia. Um, as you can see, the term manner of manufacture remains in the language of um, our Patents Act today. So I guess you could say that the law regulating some of the latest technological innovations is in part based on words written about 400 years ago. So in order to get um, patent protection today in Australia, um, you need to meet these three main requirements. The first one is that uh, the invention must be a manner of manufacture, which means that uh, the, um, the subject matter um, must be um, considered the type that is suitable for patent protection. So things like business methods, abstract ideas are not uh, considered patentable subject matter. Uh, things like um, products, um, an internal combustion engine, for example, would be considered patentable subject matter. Once you meet the eligibility criteria under patentable, um, on the manner of manufacture, you also need to meet the requirements for novelty and inventive step. And this means that the invention must be new in light of everything um, that is known today. And whatever is new has to be not obvious for a skilled person that has um, general knowledge in, in the relevant um, technical field. The patent term for a standard patent today um, is 20 years from the filing date. So before I, I um, go into more discussion about manner of manufacture, I thought um, it would be useful to kind of explain what um, a patent specification looks like for anyone that's not familiar with them. Um, I've taken a very simple invention uh, from Google Patents. This is a, a specification for a granted US patent for this invention in relation to what's called a, a beer barella. 
so an umbrella for your beer. Um, and the invention can be, um, I guess, divided into three main parts. So the first part will include some drawings to illustrate what the invention um, looks like, how, how, how it works. Uh, and the second part will be a detailed description, which needs to provide an enabling disclosure to allow somebody else um, skilled in this area to be able to put the invention into practice. And finally, there are some numbered paragraphs at the end of the specification called claims. And these set out uh, essential features of the invention to define the scope of protection. And things like infringement, novelty, and inf inventive step are assessed um, based on the claims. For a, a, a physical product such as this one, um, the, it is without question um, a considered patentable subject matter. But for things like uh, computer implemented inventions, it's a little bit more complicated. It's a fairly challenging area of law because um, it, it can it can um, it can cover quite a wide range of different areas. For example, um, in the area of e-commerce, uh, a computer implemented invention sits at the intersection of um, technology relating to the computer and also non-patentable subject matters, um, such as, for example, a business method, which the patent office considers to be an abstract idea, which is not patentable. Um, also, the definition for what is considered to be a manner of manufacture is not actually defined in our act. So th the interpretation is based on many, many years of case law, um, and, uh, and this is uh, constantly changing. Uh, on this slide, I've set out the basically the, the, the current position in Australia. So um, the, the patent office, um, when considering the question of computer implemented inventions, this is what they do. First, they uh, determine the substance of the invention. And to do that, you have to construe the entire specification and, and not just look at the form of the invention as defined by the words of the claims. And they, they look at things like, how does the invention work? What problems does the invention solve? What are the advantages of the invention and what is the contribution of the invention as described in the specification? Once they determine the substance of the invention, they go through a list of questions uh, to determine whether or not um, the invention should be considered patentable subject matter. I haven't listed all of the questions here because there's quite a lot of them, but I've listed a couple of the key ones. So one of the key questions is that whether or not there's a technical problem inside or outside the computer. So if I give you an example of a technical problem outside the computer, the machine learning algorithm might be applied to some other technical field, for example, a medical um, tech, uh, med tech application, um, robotics, control systems. So that would be considered um, solving a technical problem outside the computer. If it's solving a problem, a technical problem inside the computer, the patent office looks at whether or not there's an improvement in the functioning of the computer irrespective of the data being processed. So um, the invention may be in relation to, for example, quantum computing or improvements to system architecture or memory allocation um, with respect to the computer itself. In a recent case, Aristocrat, um, the full court posed a new question, um, which is whether or not there's an advance in computer technology. There's some commentary as to whether or not this is quite a, a high threshold for a, a, an in, a, a patent eligibility test and whether or not there's um, some conflation between the test for manner of manufacture and novelty and inventive step. That decision is current, um, currently on appeal to the High Court, and we hope that um, the High Court will issue uh, their decision later on this year. So we'll see what happens um, in this area. Uh, because machine learning is a relatively new area of technology, we don't have a lot of case law um, relating to um, AI and machine learning related inventions. So I thought it might be useful to have a look at some recently accepted Australian patent applications in the patent classification GO6N. And the first application we'll have a look at is in relation to uh, quantum computation. So quantum computers provide uh, more computational capacity for certain types of difficult problems. And in quantum computers, 
the computational tasks are performed by implementing sequences of um, these things called quantum gates. And the faster the quantum gates execute, the more quantum capacity there is for the quantum computer. And there are obstacles for realizing fast, high fidelity quantum gates, and these relate to leakage errors and quantum hardware control noise. In um, this figure here, which I've taken from the specification, uh, you have a classical processor. So this is one of the embodiments of the invention. You have a classical processor, um, 104, and this is used to design control trajectories for implementation on the quantum gates in order to reduce errors and noise. And claim one, which is one of the main claims in, in the specification, is directed to a method for designing a quantum control trajectory on quantum computing hardware using reinforcement learning in order to minimize errors and noise. So something like this will be considered patentable subject matter in Australia because it solves a technical problem within the computer in um, the reduction of errors and noise associated with these quantum gates. There's an improvement in the functioning of the computer irrespective of the data being processed, being fast execution of gates to provide more computational capacity. And the second example I wanted to talk about uh, it's a specification um, which describes an autonomous, semi-autonomous vehicle for delivering packages. Um, in this figure, as you can see, the, um, this representation of the vehicle here going along a navigation path up to up some steps and delivering package in front of a door. So claim one for this specification is directed to a computer implemented method that determines the navigation path using an artificial neural network that's been trained on similar paths. The artificial neural network receives sensor input and information regarding locomotive capabilities of the vehicle, and the vehicle can receive remote assistance depending on a determined confidence level associated with the path. Something like this would also be considered patentable subject matter in Australia because it solves a technical problem outside the computer. I thought this would be a good example to give in conjunction with the last one because the last one solved a technical problem inside the computer. This is a technical problem outside the computer. Um, and the problem um, solved being the navigation of an autonomous vehicle and the use of a neural network to determine navigation path and a confidence, a confidence level for remote assistance when required. Um, and finally, I wanted to discuss um, this uh, recent Australian Patent Office decision for an application filed by Accenture, Accenture Global Solutions. The application is directed to a computer system for managing incidents for an organization. Um, some examples of these incidents might include, for example, faulty connections for a specific utilities infrastructure at a particular location. And you can imagine that for a large organization, there may be lots of dif these different types of incidents in any given day. And it's important for them to figure out who does what and what order and how to deal with these incidents. So the invention is in relation to a system that helps the organization in uh, managing these incidents. And uh, the figures here um, illustrate how the invention works according to one embodiment described in the specification. So I'll quickly go through that now. So um, you have organization data and you have these incident data here, old incident data, new incident data, and the AI uh, machine learning system is here. It includes a, a module for receiving the incident data. There are some modules for pre-processing the data to clean up the data and to extract certain features from the data. A machine learning model here is trained and tested based on the pre-processed data. You also have um, a corpus generator, which generates a data set, set um, illustrated in figure six here, which maps the organizations to respective KPIs. And then the output basically uses the trained classification model and the corpus to determine the organization or operation impacted by the new incidents and a KPI associated with that operation in order to perform some kind of prioritization. So the organization knows um, what to deal with first. This application uh, was eventually refused in Australia because the hearing officer um, considered that the substance of the invention was in relation to a mere business scheme for analyzing 
organizational parameters to prioritize and control actions within an organization. So there's no technical problem outside computer technology. The problem solved outside computer technology is the business method, so that's not technical. And the features of the computer implementation uh, related to functional data processing steps that are defined by the, the data that they process. And, and um, so there's no improvement to computer technology and no improvement to the functioning of a computer. So the, um, the hearing officer also considered that there was no technical problem inside the computer either. The hearing officer also said that the general practicality and usefulness of the invention was insufficient to confer patentability in this case. It's, it's interesting to contrast this to uh, the corresponding US application, which was eventually granted for the exact same invention. The US examiner considered that uh, the business scheme was integrated into a practical application, which resulted in something significantly more than just the abstract idea itself. There was also a useful application. And even though each of the individual elements was known, <clears throat> there was an inventive concept in the non-conventional and non-generic arrangement of those elements. And finally, um, let's have a quick look at some emerging issues. Many of you may have heard in the news um, recently about um, Dabas cases debating whether AI machines can be named as inventors on patent applications so what is happening here is that a number of applications were filed around the world naming an AI machine called DABUS, which stands for Device for Autonomous Bootstrapping of Unified Sentience, as the sole inventor for um, a couple of inventions, one for a food container and another one for a flashlight. The um, AI machine uh, DABUS is alleged to be the sole inventor for these inventions. And whether or not um, this is factually correct was not challenged uh, by the patent offices or the, or the courts. So the question that they considered uh, was solely whether or not the word inventor in patent legislation as it currently stands in various countries can be interpreted to include an AI machine. So in Australia, um, momentarily it was considered um, in the full court uh, sorry, in the federal court decision that uh, the word inventor in Australia could be construed to um, include an AI machine, but then that decision was overturned by the full court um, and the full court considered that the um, act requires an inventor to be a natural person. Similarly, in these other jurisdictions, New Zealand, US, UK and Europe, it was considered that the AI machine couldn't be considered an inventor and the inventor had to be an actual person um, or in other words, a, a human being. In Germany, the German Federal, uh, Federal Patent Court um, came up with a, a, a pragmatic solution to the problem. So they said that the listed inventor must be a natural person, even if an AI has identified both the problem and the solution. And the AI system itself can be additionally named. In South Africa, the patent was granted in the name of um, DABUS, but this was mostly because um, there's no substantive examination procedure in South Africa. Um, the application was a PCT international application designating South Africa. So under their regulations, the South African office didn't have any means to object to the application on the basis of um, the, the details for the inventor. There are also a number of um, corresponding applications pending in these other jurisdictions. Um, so uh, we're waiting to see what happens with those applications. So um, what now? Well, rapid changes in technological um, innovation is always pushing the boundaries of our legal interpretation. In Australia, the meaning of manner of manufacture in relation to computer implemented in inventions is, is constantly evolving. 
We're currently, as mentioned, we're waiting for um, the High Court, which is Australia's apex court, to consider the question of uh, patentability of a computer implemented invention for the first time ever. So this is kind of a, a big deal for, for, um, for us that, um, uh, that practice in this area. IP5, which is a forum of five um, of the largest intellectual property offices uh, in the world, was set up um, in recent years to improve efficiency of examination process for patents worldwide. Um, and the five offices include the European Patent Office, the Japanese Patent Office, the Korean Patent Office, Chinese Patent Office, and the US Patent Office. One of the objectives for IP5 is to determine the impact of new emerging technologies, um, such as AI on the patent system. Uh, and they engage with industry uh, to develop appropriate responses. Members from each of the offices meet once every few years to discuss things like how to classify patents filed in um, new emerging tech areas such as artificial intelligence um, and how to update patent examination guidelines for AI technology in order to provide um, transparency and better legal uh, certainty. Um, and in recent years, uh, the examination guidelines for US, Europe, China, Japan, and Korea have been updated to include specific sections um, setting out um, um, how, to, um, how to patent AI-related inventions in those countries, which has been helpful. Um, something to keep in mind, I guess, is that this is a, a constantly evolving area of technology, which means that the law is also constantly evolving um, in, a, in an attempt to keep up. Of course, there's always a bit of a lag because it takes some time for us to really understand the impact of these changes in technology and how to apply the relevant areas of law. So I guess my, um, my, my advice would be that if you're looking to um, seek IP protection for your AI-related invention is to seek... Um, advice early um, so that uh, you have a better idea uh, about how to um, protect your invention. Um, and that brings me to the end of the formal part of the presentation for today. Um, and I'll move on to questions. Thank you, Helen. Uh, very informative and uh, detailed overview of AI and, and recent patent applications in Australia. Thank you. It's quite, uh, uh, quite a moving feast. Uh, please uh, post your questions to Helen on the, uh, on the chat function on the right of your screen. Helen, can I start? You mentioned the, the recent uh, uh, case of, uh, of um, aristocrat. Um, what are you hoping for in the outcome of the High Court? decision in that case? Um, yep, thanks, Luan. That's a, a good question. So um, the invention in that case is in relation to an electronic um, gaming machine. So um, you can uh, uh, um, essentially a slot machine, um, but without the mechanical reels and levers, and, um, and it's all electronic. So the forecourt in that um, a decision posed some new questions, uh, which are that um, whether the invention is a computer implemented invention, and if so, um, can the invention uh, uh, claimed um, broadly be described as an advance in computer technology? Um, there's a couple of issues with this. Um, the first one is that this is we think that this is quite a high high bar for. Um, a patent eligibility test. Um, and in other fields of technology, for example, mechanical engineering, there's no such requirement for an advance in that technology area. So, so um, they just need to meet the requirements for novelty and inventive step. And in order to meet the requirement for inventive step, you just have to have, you can, it, it's, it's um, acceptable to have a non-obvious combination of known elements um, or to provide a non-obvious alternative. So there's not necessarily a requirement to advance that particular area of technology. Um, so to have a higher threshold test specifically for computer implemented inventions, 
um, is potentially inconsistent with our international obligations under the TRIPS agreement, um, under the WTO, which requires that um, member countries make patents available for any inventions, whether um, products or processes in all fields of technology without discrimination. The second um, concern is that um, even if for some reason this higher threshold test um, should be used for computer implemented inventions, in my humble opinion, um, I, I, I don't think that this is the right approach for all types of computer implemented inventions. As I mentioned previously, you could potentially have an invention which solves a technical problem outside the computer. So for example, if an, if, if an AI um, is, uh, algorithm is, a, is applied to um, you know, a control fusion reactor or movement of a robot arm or a, a, a medical field, for example, um, the, the, if there is an advance, the advance is in the other technical field and not necessarily the computer itself. So I think in those um, scenarios, um, there shouldn't be this requirement to also advance, um, to provide an advancement in computer technology. Uh, so um, we're hoping that the High Court would provide us with some clarity in relation to these issues and, and how to apply the right tests um, for all types of computer implementing inventions. Thank you. We have a question from Morris. Thank you, Morris. Um, regarding the test case at the High Court, how will that decision impact the use or otherwise of that IP in other worldwide jurisdictions? Um, good question. Thank you, Morris. Um, so um, every, every jurisdiction has um, their own uh, legislation for how to consider the question of patentable subject matter. In Australia, it's, it's called manner of manufacture. Um, uh, and in other in other regions like the uh, in Europe and US, it's it's um, a similar concept, but the consideration for it is is different because their law is different. Um, so, for example, uh, in Europe, the require they, they look for um, either a, a a technical implementation or a technical application. So. It's, in sim it's similar in a way uh, because of the requirement for something technical, but um, the specific way that they apply the test is different. And in Europe, um, only technical features can contribute to a uh, technical effect um, and be considered um, when it comes to the question of inventive steps. So um, in Europe, the, uh, the consideration of um, in a way, patentable subject matter and inventive step is um, is related. Uh, so, so that so um, I guess that's a long-winded way of um, saying that the High Court decision will only apply for Australia um, because it's it's um, it's interpreting the words of Australian legislation um, and and shouldn't affect um, how this question is considered overseas. But having said that, um, this is a very new area of law and. Um, Countries with similar legislation are always looking um, at what is happening um, in each country to, to help um, guide the consideration in their respective countries. So in Australia, some of our um, some of the, 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 the principles around how to consider this area um, is actually taken from uh, UK, European and US legislation um, over the years. Um, uh, as the case law has evolved. So um, so I guess it, it remains to be seen specifically how, but um, um, but but technically it's it's uh, it's just for Australia, so it should um, it, it, it should mostly just affect um, Australian consideration. Thanks, Helen. Uh, you mentioned the issue of AI machines, you know, being named as inventors. What's your thought on that? Should they be uh, named as inventors? Should we see AI machines uh, to be named as inventors? Um, uh, thanks for that question. So um, the Davis cases that I mentioned in the presentation um, 
in those cases, the only consideration was whether or not the word inventor in the existing legislation um, can be interpreted to include AI inventors um, from an administrative formality point of view. I think the question though, whether or not it's in our national interest um, in the promotion of our economic growth to um, allow AI inventors to be um, named on patent applications is an entirely different question. Um, and I think that's probably more of a question for our policymakers. And um, in order to, to assess that, um, they would have to engage in, with AI experts and consult with um, various industry groups to be more informed and, and to understand what is actually happening in this area. My understanding is that um, current AI systems are not yet sophisticated enough to require IP laws to be updated to include um, AI machines to be named as inventors. Um, for the most part, um, current AI and machine learning systems um, look for patterns in data and there's significant human input in, um, for example, the, the choosing the setting up of the AI algorithm, training the model, and also understanding and interpreting the output and applying that output to solve a specific problem. So <clears throat> the human input in the operation of AI systems, I think is significant and um, whether an AI system can actually um, be considered to device an invention in the first place, um, that um, that will have to consider the, the human input element and whether or not it's in our national interest to, to, to change the policy will be somewhat guided by um, guide that. Thank you, Helen. We have a question from Colin. I'm involved in commercialization of a new chip for the brain of robots. There is no computer use. The robot involves no software. In theory, is this AGI? How would it, its invention <laughs> claims be received? Interesting. Um, I'm not sure I, I fully understand that question. Um, In theory, is this, is this AGI? Um, there's lots of definitions, different definitions of AGI. I think generally the idea is that um, there is um, some ability so that so the machine learning algorithm is not just focused on solving one problem. There's just some generality, whether it's solving um, a number of different problems or um, it has some ability to um, train itself um, or conduct some kind of general training so that it can be applied to solving um, any problem, for example, um, like a human. Um, so, um, so I guess it depends on what this new chip for the brain of the robots um, do, what, what, what problems it's actually um, trying to solve. There's no software. Um, how would the invention and claims received? So if there's no software, the invention is in relation to the hardware chips. Um, typically, so, so uh, um, something that's um, related to hardware um, more generally um, meets the requirements for patentable subject matter, um, generally would meet the requirements for patentable subject matter. It's usually software related inventions where um, there's an abstract idea, you're solving some business scheme that you run into these problems with patentable subject matter. So if there's um, is a new chip that has some new configuration that solves some technical problem over existing chips, then um, I would say that, um, you know, that's potentially uh, patentable. Thank you, Helen. Uh, a question from Anna. Given that this is a very new area of law and that it is a fast evolving topic, how does someone with knowledge in this area become a patent attorney? Um, uh, thanks for that question, Anna. So um, how to become a patent attorney? S so there are a number of requirements. So first, um, you need to have a, uh, in Australia, you need to have a technical background. 
um, some something in the in the area of um, engineering or science. And then in order to become a registered patent attorney, you need to undertake some additional study um, of uh, IP law. Um, there's a set of subjects that are um, prescribed by the board um, and you have to um, pass all of those subjects. You also need to have some um, meet the experience requirements. I think these days it's um, a couple of years of work experience with, a, um, with an IP firm um, and those are um, the main requirements for becoming a registered patent attorney in Australia. Can AI be considered to be an inventor if in the area of medtech research, uh, where AI is a principal contributor to advances in medical research, and without uh, it, the medical research would not be possible? I think we're going to see a lot more of that, aren't we, in, in medical research, the use of AI. Mm. Can AI be considered an inventor? So at the moment, for a lot of the uh, major jurisdictions around the world, they're saying that no, the the legislation um, requires there be there to be a human inventor, a natural person, um, to be named on the patent application um, for it to meet uh, formality requirements for the patent application. Um, my understanding is that typically, though, um, in in these areas whilst um, the AI tool could help guide an area of research or speed up um, the research in certain areas, um, there's still some human involvement. And in those cases, um, typically the, the, the people um, involved uh, would be, if they materially contribute to the invention, that they would be named as inventors rather than the AI machine itself. be of any relevance in a rapidly advancing AI future? Sorry, Luan, you cut out there for a bit. Um, ah, here's the question. How can current patent law be of any relevance? Um, how can it be of any relevance? So patent law is relevant in um, rewarding and providing an incentive for innovation. Um, how it works is that um, that um, you know a, a research organization might invest a lot of money in um, in in in, um, in working um, on on certain projects that um, and and overcome uh, problems in new um, novel ways and uh, to reward that um, the system. Uh, provides a limited time monopoly um, so that uh, so that the the organization can have a commercial advantage when they try to commercialize their invention um, without um, some inventions can only be um, protected by patents so if you don't have patent protection um, and you invest a lot of time and money into coming up with something in new coming out with a new invention and you don't protect it then the risk is that somebody could uh, could take um, to copy your invention and there's there's nothing you could do about it. Um, so the the relevance is the IP protection, um, which protects the um, the R and D and incentivizes R and D in a particular area to promote innovation in that area. Thank you, Helen. The final question is from David. What if a human can't describe how AI creates something as it is developed with algorithms in the technology? Might a patent just provide a start point, a technology black box, and an end point? Um, really good question, David. Um, so a lot of, I guess, machine learning algorithms um, can be seen as black boxes because um, you might not really understand how specifically the machine learning model is, is doing what it's doing. You provide input, you train it, and it, it gives you the output that um, you want um, to solve a particular problem. There's no um, requirement to specifically describe what is happening in the, in, the, in the machine learning AI model. So the disclosure requirement for a specification is that you need to provide an enabling disclosure for someone who is skilled in the area to be able to put that invention into practice. So if it's a well-known AI model, you know, convolutional neural networks, um, 
you don't have to describe spe specifically what, how it works, how it processes data, because that is already known anyway, and your invention um, would be, um, you know, typical. Uh, for example, might be in relation to how that model is applied in a particular field of technology to solve some other problem. So you'd have to describe that. Helen, thank you. That wraps up the uh, questions. We've just run a little over time, but uh, we've had a few good questions, and uh, I'd like to ask the audience to uh, just take a moment to um, provide your feedback. Uh, it's really important for us to know whether you enjoyed the event, how you, whether you found it worthwhile, uh, please click the link below to take a few minutes to complete an anonymous survey. Uh, it'll be very useful for us. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, I must mention an upcoming network event, our annual showcase event, the Graham Clark Oration, uh, which is being held in Melbourne on the 12th of July at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. This year's oration will be delivered by Dr. Natalia Trajanova of Johns Hopkins University. Um, she's, uh, her oration in Engineering Your Heart's Health, Dr. Trajanova will discuss how the merging of AI, imaging and personalised medical history is now able to predict the risk of cardiac death several years in advance. Quite, uh, quite an amazing uh, story. Um, attendance is free of charge, uh, but registration is essential. So please visit the Oration website, grahamclarkoration.org.au uh, for more information and to register. Uh, I must thank the network sponsors for their support who make these events possible. I'm grateful for their commitment to promote the communication of leading edge science and ideas with the public. And finally, to thank you, uh, our audience, for giving us some of your valuable time. I hope you found the discussion informative and worthwhile. Please visit the network website to check out past events and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And a final thank you to Helen uh, for sharing the history and advances of AI uh, and for recommending your favorite movie. Uh, should anyone wish to contact Helen, uh, you can find her on LinkedIn or just visit the Phillips Orman Fitzpatrick website, prf.com.au. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, please stay safe and be healthy. Goodbye.